Uh, let me introduce uh, Bob and James from St. Andrew's Episcopal School. Uh, please take the stage. Thank you. All right. So I'm James, um, and I'll briefly go through our agenda for today. Uh, give you some background to our one-to-one -one program and how we designed it. Some considerations that we had to take into account while designing and creating the program. And then Bob is going to do kind of the heavy lifting and actually what we do. Um, he's the brains behind the operation and the reason why we're presenting today. Um, so designing a one-to-one -one program. Um, one of the big things for us, so we are a two-year-old to 12th grade school in Potomac, Maryland, St. Andrew's Episcopal School. Um, I'm the director of technology. Bob is our laptop program coordinator who joined us when this program was created. We had laptop carts, which I'm sure everybody here is familiar with. Um, well, actually, let me start by asking who here is from education? I'm going to raise it. <laughs> awesome. That's fantastic. That's great. Who has an Apple-based one-to-one program? All right. All right. And who's thinking about starting one now? All right. Great. So the people that are thinking about starting a one-to-one -one program, I was you um, five years ago. I was at Jamf Nation 2011 with not really a good idea on how we were going to do it. But thank God Jamf has Casper, or now Jamf Pro, which <laughs> made our lives incredibly easy. So we were laptop cart-based and Citrix-based, um, and it wasn't really great. Um, the connectivity was so-so, everything else. It just didn't work as the teachers expected in the classroom. And as you can imagine, when you have a 50-minute period and you've got to get through a lot, tech doesn't need to be a hurdle. It should be a tool. Um, so we wanted to get everybody on the same platform. That's kind of why we thought one-to-one -one versus BYOD. It also fit our supportive and innovative culture. So we didn't want to there be like a class disparity between you know, kids that may not have the ability to buy the latest and greatest MacBook Pro, and you know, he may come in with a Chromebook or something. We wanted everybody to be on the same platform for our teachers and for our sanity. It also is now just opening doors to new blended and flipped classroom initiatives because people know what they have at home and what tools they have, and we decide that. So it's been an amazing, amazing program. Um, so what is our one-to-one -one program? We start with a 13-inch MacBook Air. Of course, we add Apple Care. So we have a three-year rotation um, through the laptops. A case and sleeve is provided. Good opportunity to get your branding out. Um, so everything is customized with our logo. We give them software, lots of nice software. So we have Microsoft Office 2016. The entire Adobe Creative Cloud suite is available to every child, but it's not pre-installed. Neither of these actually now, starting this year, are pre-installed, and we leverage self-service to distribute them to students. And then CrashPlan. So we have been using CrashPlan for five years since the start of our program, and it's been fantastic, and we hope to continue that um, as long as we can get their pricing to fit our needs. Um, that was just a throw out in case anybody here is from Code42. <laughs> um, open DNS filtering. Of course, we have to filter our computers. Our students aren't admins over their laptops, and so we have the ability to be restrictive on their content. We decided to do end user filtering, meaning that it's installed on the client machine as opposed to on the network itself. That was partly contributed to the way our network was configured at the time. Even now that we have the ability, we like the flexibility of it following the child home and not having to run a proxy back to our network. Lastly, Google Apps for Education is kind of our backbone, and just as an FYI, because all this stuff was, I mean, really helpful for me to know. That's why I'm providing it to you. It's not the kind of meat and potatoes that Bob will be talking about, how we leverage Jamf, but it was very helpful for me to know when I was in your position of starting it. Um, so what else did we have to consider? Number one, network. Network is super important. Um, we have our program, our title or of our presentation is called 500 plus devices, but we have probably about 1,000 devices on campus. And as you know, schools use a lot of bandwidth, like Google Earth, whatever the teaching tools are using in the classroom, maybe streaming video, uses a lot. So don't ignore your network. Um, so we looked, we got a new ISP, um, replaced all our backbone with 10 gig fiber, and updated our wireless system. We chose Aruba. There's a many, many competitors out there, and they all provide great products, but just something to be aware of. Damage and repairs. The first year, um, we, did, we 
used a product, um, well actually I won't name them, but it was an insurance company and it was very, very expensive. Um, for about 120 laptops, which is how we started our program, very small, our premiums were about $20,000 and that was with a $250 deductible. So a lot of added cost. And over those first few years, and we started it with the young kids, um, so it was fourth through sixth grade, we didn't have that much breakage. So all that was just kind of sunk costs. So when we looked to redo it, we just, on the next round, we had a big purchase year, about 350 Apple laptops. We decided to self-insure. And because they quoted us over $60,000 for the three-year premium for accidental uh, damage. So we decided to self-insure. We still haven't gotten close, and now five years in, to that $60,000 premium. So if you are like considering how to work with damage and breakage, it's not as bad. I mean, partly is education. Bob is fantastic in wandering the hallways and kind of um, laptops that are ignored um, or just kind of shoved aside. He'll pick up and kind of scare the student for a little bit, hide it, give it to a um, admin or the front desk, let that student kind of freak out a bit and then go and find it. Um, not that we want to keep them from doing their work, but sometimes it's good just to get them to understand that this is a really expensive piece of equipment and they should treat it as such. The last thing is incredibly difficult thing to do, and I don't know if we're the experts on it, but we've worked at it, and I think our parents are now happy. When we first started it, it was very tough, but it's the concerns of the parents, because in a lot of cases, the students know the tech better than the parents do. So there's a lot of workarounds and a lot of fibbing to their parents and stuff like that. So you need to support them. So we started off with a couple of parent education events and nights, and that's been helpful. But just kind of following up with communication of how we filter, what we filter, when we filter it, give it to your division heads, let them communicate it. It's important because when you first kind of expand your program or start a program, it's a huge concern because the parents kind of feel like a fish out of water. Um, so now I'm going to pass it to the brains. So this is Bob. He's our laptop program coordinator. He's been with us five years, and he does all the heavy work while I'm on vacation in the summer. <laughs> um, so uh, you get all of these laptops, and something that Jamf hasn't created yet was how do I uh, solve all the manual labor? Because 300 machines, even when Apple sends it in nice packaging, is still 300 machines you have to unbox label, shell, and sleeve. And as it says there, don't underestimate the time that this is going to take because it can take one person a few weeks. <laughs> um, and that is definitely the thing that eats up all of my time during the summer, I would say, or the majority of the time. Uh, so here was our order this year. Uh, came on pallets, individual boxes. Um, I'm not sure if Apple has changed the way that they ship large shipments because it used to be we would get a box of like five or ten or, or five or ten in a box, and now they've the last two three years it's been individual boxes, which uh, as you can see be, turns into a pile of like three hundred thousand dollars or something. <laughs> um, and then once they all get unboxed, the uh, pile of trash, <laughs> which also. That's another thing uh, to take into consideration is all of the trash that it creates. Like that, it's a lot of uh, there's a lot of waste. Um, so be nice to your maintenance people so that they'll get rid of it all. So uh, people want to know though because you're all here. How do we do this? How do we image? How, you know, the main thing that we do is via target disk mode. Um, I think uh, everybody, uh, if you aren't familiar, if you hold down the T key at uh, boot, it'll go into, it'll just create, uh, turn your laptop or your Mac into a giant external hard drive. And from there, then depending on the machine, we uh, do a full image versus a thin image. Um, the full image roughly takes four and a half minutes to copy via uh, Thunderbolt. Um, and the thin Im image, three minutes roughly. Um, when you multiply it, as it says, by hundreds, you start to see a huge difference uh, in time. The second part of an image, though, is when it has to check into Casper. Uh, so it, 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 you, you've, you've pushed all the software to it, now it has to check in, and we like to call it like the shelf or whatever. 
basically just any open network port um, in, in our office, we start to plug in machines so that they can do their, their check-in. Uh, and it, it takes roughly 10 to 15 minutes to do that. Uh, and we, from there, it's installing PKGs uh, and is doing thing, a whole bunch of different scripts uh, and updates. Uh, so some of the things that we run at that point is uh, there's a great script out there that uh, actually will use your login information to log into the Mac App Store. You can push your login information. And so it goes and it goes and it actually downloads the newest version of iMovie uh, that's available in the Mac App Store. Because I know that these machines are probably not going to get too much updating once they get in the hands of the student. It's just the way it kind of is. Uh, end users tend not to update, and it's hard to push updates sometimes when there are things like iMovie that might be a gig and a half or, or, or more. For it to be on for long enough to get that uh, turns into a problem. So I like to push uh, the newest of, the, of apps available, and I like to push software updates so that I'm handing them the absolute newest uh, available. Other things that, that happen at that point, um, it blesses the system because I've seen times, plenty of times where uh, it, the startup drive seems to forget that it's the startup drive. Um, and so it's, it's kind of, uh, a few years ago we saw it where you know, uh, a half dozen students came back to us with uh, machines they thought they had broke after one day because they had restarted it and uh, the machines no longer were, were blessed. So I, I just added a script in there that does that. Um, I added uh, from this, this screen, it uh, enables remote management. So there may be times when I need to uh, SSH into the machine, when I need to VNC into a machine, um, and we have an admin account on the machines, and so uh, a script that runs at the, uh, the shelf time does that. Uh, there is also scripts available that, down, that uh, uh, go and download the absolute newest version of Firefox, Chrome, and Java. These are all key things that get updated maybe once an hour, it seems like. Um, we like to set the time and the location. Uh, that way, if it's fresh out of the box, it tends to think it's from Cupertino. Um, we're in Washington, D.C., so it helps to set the, the, the date and time and location. We also like to remove pages, keynote, and uh, uh, pages, keynote, numbers, and garage band. And uh, pages, keynotes, numbers kind of make sense because of, uh, we don't want people distributing pages files instead of word files. Uh, uh, and, but garage band, the interesting thing is we found if we left it on there, it asks for the admin password the, basically the first time they use it, and our students are not admins of the machine. Um, so they're kind of out of luck to use GarageBand at that moment. Um, so anyways, the very first year that we did this, uh, this has been a, a uh, evolution, if you will, of our, our imaging system. The very first year, we did it netbooting USB Ethernet adapters. And as, as James said, it was like 120 devices. Uh, I think about 75, 70 of those or so went to, uh, to the students, and the rest were in faculty staff hands. That process took me like, I don't know, a week and a half, and I thought I was a rock star with that. I thought this was the coolest thing, because previously, um, when I had done imaging, it was a full monolithic image where I kind of did it like an Apple system restore, and each one would take like a day. <laughs> Um, and so I thought, this is amazing. Like, we got through 75 machines in a week and a half or so. Um, but USB to Ethernet Apple adapters are painfully slow. <laughs> so something we learned. Um, we were also pushing the full all OS, and we would push Microsoft Office. We would push Adobe Photoshop. We also had lots and lots of PKGs and, and, and DMGs that we installed. It was basically just dump everything. Dump the... Dump the mother load of everything they could ever need because it was easier that way at that time. Um, it was a mix of sort of a monolithic, modular thing because we had a lot of packages, but, but we were also kind of baking in things that we knew that everybody wanted, such as uh, uh, Microsoft Office and Photoshop. These are things that were going on every machine. So we just figured, let's just put it baked right into the image. So uh, then... 
Here was year one. We could do uh, 15 machines at once, just all net booted, which also is uh, compared to, to uh, 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 years later with, with target disk mode, you know, it, you have to wait for that to net boot <laughs> and everything. And this was just a, such a slow, inefficient method looking back on it. But it got us to year two, where we did Thunder, uh, Thunderbolt uh, Ethernet adapters. And now, instead of like, let's say, three, four minutes for a boot over this painfully slow USB Ethernet, uh, now we're getting you know, one or two minutes to boot up into the uh, uh, net boot image alone. And now we're going from, from a small portion of the school on the one-to-one -to, -one to the entire school. So we went from like 75 students to um, now we're at like 300 plus students with, with machines. Same, same basic install, faster pipes, like it says there. Um, same exact basically build. But now we went from like a week and a half to a week with more numbers. So we're, kind of, we're getting faster and faster. And, and every year I was, I was kind of learning a little bit more about the uh, Casper suite. And now year three is when we started, year three and four is when things started to really start to rock and roll. Um, we started to do target disk mode. I had learned about local Casper distribution points. Um, and that is you can copy your entire uh, JSS uh, distribution onto a local machine, onto a, a, uh, an external hard drive, onto almost anything, an image from that. Um, and this, this allowed us to then build four Mac minis with SSDs. We kind of beefed them up a little bit instead of the slow, like 4,800, 5,200 RPM drive, because that would probably have been as slow as the uh, USB or, or uh, Thunderbolt uh, network adapters. So we put SSDs in them, which are a cheap upgrade. So if you're going to do something like this, I highly suggest popping some SSDs into Mac minis because the minis themselves are cheap and SSDs are cheap. So we're still doing full OS with Microsoft Office and everything baked in, but now we started doing less PKGs, less DMGs, more scripts and more downloading post-install. Um, so the, uh, the slow part of, of copying the machine got a lot faster. Still a mix of monolithic and modular. But year five is, year five is when things uh, got the best, this, this past year, I would say. Um, I decided to do it more of a uh, thin, thin, thin image, <laughs> excuse me. Um, those 300 machines that we got, we got them in June. So they were new. They, were, they had the newest system. Everything was pretty much the newest, I knew at this point. Uh, Apple had not released any major, major system upgrades, updates, I should say, in a little, little bit. So it was pretty all right with uh, leaving them with the operating system that came by default. And so uh, a thin image, I didn't have to now, um, I didn't have to push an operating system, so f five to 10 gigs, something like that, um, onto a machine. I also, this was the first year we decided to leverage more of self-service, and we didn't pre-install things like Microsoft Office. We didn't pre-install things like uh, Adobe Photoshop. And a lot of this also will let us now learn to see how many people actually use this software that we were giving them, because they have to go out and get it. So we had more scripts, more policies that happened um, post-install and while the machines are being used. And you can kind of see here, it's not super readable, I knew it wouldn't be, but you know, an idea of the, the type of things that we, um, we install that, that kind of run at the, the shelf time. Um, the biggest group of packages we like to install is printer drivers. Um, we want to cover almost every printer that a student might run into or have at home because, once again, like I said, they're not admins of the machine. So if I go and grab all of the newest printer drivers, as long as they don't just have bought the latest and greatest HP, um, this is probably going to cover it. And even that HP, it's probably going to cover it. Um, the next couple of things that we do, I like to have some scripts that run at the shelf that block iCloud that disable setup assistant. A lot of these things that get them working 
get them to the desktop faster. Um, it marks the type of image. And this was very useful for um, a lot of the time we like to, uh, um, you know, scope something out based on if you're just a faculty member, just a, a, a staff member, or just a student. Let us categorize quicker um, who's what. Uh, other, other than like setting the department and creating a giant uh, smart group of this, this, that does it equal this, does it equal this, does it, or, or does it equal this. I can just say, you know, find all the student, find all of the faculty, find all the staff. It was a better way, a quicker way to uh, get that reporting I needed. Um, another thing that happens there is a script that uh, gives permission. It kind of upgrades the students to sort of a power user in a sense. Uh, they, they don't have the uh, ability to remove applications, but they can uh, install applications from the um, App Store. They can change settings from uh, all over system preferences. Specifically, the network system preference is the one that I wanted them to be able to use, because when you go home, you might need that for uh, the ability to connect to a home Wi-Fi or change something with your home Wi-Fi. And if you totally lock them out of that, it kind of really makes it tough to do that. <laughs> um, and a couple of the things that actually uh, happen here, um, there's one of them uh, is that uh, detects the network um, adapter. So that shelf that we have, the, they're now all Thunderbolt adapters on there. And the latest round of uh, either the operating system, either be it, it the Casper suite or maybe the, the hardware version, whatever it is, doesn't seem to detect it unless you tell it to detect the network. So I've had to add in these little fixes here and there that do things like that. Um, and let's see. Oop. There we go. So the login scripts. There's a, there's a couple of scripts that happen right at login, and the You'll see here in a second, the, the first one populates Casper information. So this was a, a very useful thing. It reads the current user uh, who's logged in. Then it, it hits up our Active Directory server and gets more information sort of about them. It, it says, you know, their full name, their, uh, all of our students, the depart their, their group in, in AD is their uh, uh, graduation year. So uh, it gets their, their user information like that. Um, and then we populate that to cat, uh, up into uh, the JSS. Um, and so it, po it, it sets their department in uh, the JSS to be what their graduation year is. It sets their name, the, the owner, uh, you know, a whole lot of that information. And it's, once again, super useful to then be able to scope things. Um, be able to find machines, who owns the machine, who's using the machine. This is a script that I actually wrote myself that I will, uh, um, it's just a short like couple of line thing that I'll, I'll, I'll be willing to share um, in, on the, the Jamf Nation board. The other one is uh, I wanted this whole thing to be pretty much hands free uh, for the most part when they uh, touch a machine. So another thing that happens is it downloads CrashPlan from our local CrashPlan server. It downloads the newest version of CrashPlan. Um, then it, it writes the custom configuration into slash library application support CrashPlan. Um, and so CrashPlan does its, uh, um, it does its, its uh, settings via a group ID or member ID that it, it gets out of its, uh, out of the server. So you have to kind of set that so, so based on if they're a student or a faculty member or staff member, it's getting a different, um, it's writing a different configuration file basically with that ID to tell CrashPlan then, what are you? Um, like I said, downloads that. Then an Apple script runs that installs, well, uh, a script that runs that installs CrashPlan, an Apple script that runs that launches CrashPlan. And the reason I had to use an Apple script was because uh, Bash script was not able to then hide CrashPlan so that it could be open for like 10 to 15 seconds or so, uh, and then it, it, it gracefully quits CrashPlan. And in that 10 to 15 seconds or, or whatever long it is, uh, pause that I have, I forget, uh, it does the authorization that it needs to the, to the CrashPlan server, and now that user is set up and good to run without them having to install CrashPlan, without them having to touch it. They just see it flash open, 
Um, they get confused for a second because they're a student and they wonder what's happening and they don't know anything about computers. But <laughs> um, it runs, hides, quits, configures itself. Um, so these couple of things I'm, I, I'll be sharing uh, on the, the Jamf Nation board. Um, we also use a logout script. So as James had mentioned, we use OpenDNS's umbrella filtering for our uh, content filtering. And it has to, uh, um, it, it needs a restart. So I, I knew I couldn't install it uh, at login and I couldn't install it while the user is using the machine. So I had to do it at logout. Um, so it just pushes the, the PKG uh, and their thing, uh, there, there's like a configuration file that has to sit next to the PKG file and it reads that for your uh, customer ID or whatever it has in it. And uh, then it runs and, and at logout. So other uses of scripts, like I kind of had mentioned, we like to make the student, we, we want them to feel ownership of the machine. We don't want it to just be a tool that they have, because a tool that they have, they're going to throw around. I mean, the, already they're going to throw it around because they're students. <laughs> um, but we want to make them sort of a power user. So that, like I kind of had mentioned, we give them the ability to install apps from the a Apple App Store. Uh, I give them the ability to change a, a handful of the system preferences. And I give them the ability to uh, add and remove move printers, because also, at home, it's kind of hard to um, have, have them use a machine at home if they can't add or remove printers or change settings on, on their home printers. Um, so I'm just using a lot of commands that are, are built into the system, the security authorization, uh, the security command, and it, and it writes to the authorization database. Um, I add them to the underscore app store and LP admin group. I, uh, like I said, kind of it uh, download, uh, uh, and that. Another, another use of the scripts there, too, is we have a guest network that they, um, students seem to like, think that they're going to get better access if they're not on our sort of lockdown network. So they'll try to get, join the uh, guest network. And the guest network is very restricted. And the guest network also doesn't give them access to the printers that are inside the school. Um, so I have a script that's there that actually checks to see if it's in their preferred list uh, and removes it from that. And if they're currently connected, it shuts off the Wi-Fi for a second, removes it, turns the Wi-Fi back on, and then it's automatically going to connect to our um, normal SAS network. Uh, the other thing with uh, um, a script that I use that, that's constantly running is we uh, sort of forget or fix crash plans forgetfulness and uh, crash plan seems to occasionally um, forget that it's supposed to back up I think I'm not sure what it's for I'm guessing it's based off of students never restarting or users I should say never restarting and uh, maybe some cache file gets gunked up because basically all it's doing is uh, shutting down the crash plan launch daemon uh, deleting a cache folder and then relaunching it, and it uh, re sort of indexes your backup and then continues backing up as if nothing had ever happened. So it was another way to kind of stay hands off and to be able to manage this stuff without uh, a huge team of hunting down students. Um, so I use a bunch of configuration profiles also to uh, set settings and you know all the different things that configuration profiles do. <laughs> Uh, one of them is a printing profile um, to another way to just make sure that they're able to fully uh, edit and, and, and uh, add and remove uh, printers. Um, another one is Chrome. Uh, we, we really like Chrome at the school because we're a Google Apps uh, for Education school. And um, a lot of students, though, had found out a way to get away around our filtering with VPN uh, Chrome extensions. Um, and it, funny enough, the, the one student had just admitted it to our, uh, uh, our uh, soccer coach, who is also the database man at our school. So he just came and told me, and I then got to work on figuring out how to block that. Uh, so Chrome, though, has a, a whole lot of customization that you can do to it. Um, and one of them is blocking uh, extensions. One of them, the things that we use 
uh, a Chrome pro printing pro uh, a Chrome profile for is changing printing. Uh, Chrome, Google, in all of their infinite wisdom, has uh, by default changed their uh, printing dialog box, and that uh, doesn't play nice with Arconica printers and settings that they have. So uh, another setting that I set in there is to use the system uh, default printing uh, printing uh, dialog box. The login window we customize, uh, mostly just put our logo and you know a little bit of information. Um, and we customize Safari a little bit for those who uh, are using it. Mainly, the biggest thing is I, myself, and a lot of people like the delete key to be the back. And so just sort of set that. That's the, the main one. And the bread and butter profile I like to feel is the 8021X profile. Um, I didn't want... Uh, students to have to log in to the machine and then log into the wireless. I, once again, I wanted it to be seamless from the minute that they got handed the machine. Everything was auto-configured, everything was good to go. And so the, the wireless configuration, uh, uh, at the login window, it's connected to our wireless, um, and then it's authenticating to AD and authenticating to the wireless like it's supposed to, uh, using the login window. Um, and we've luckily enough had that working since day one of our program. Um, so a couple of self-service things that we do use. Uh, we have the Creative Suite in there, like we had mentioned. We have Microsoft Office, and it includes some settings to sort of um, not have it by default saving to OneDrive. Uh, yeah, <laughs> OneDrive. Um, educational software in there that we use. And I do put GarageBand into self-service uh, with a giant warning that it is the full install um, of it because I believe it takes up like five to 10 gigs or something with all the additional instruments. But now it installs and doesn't ask for the admin password. So once again, we are hands off when once the uh, students get the machine and they realize that uh, this is in self-service for them. Uh, we, we have a couple of digital textbooks in there that the, um, that the faculty use in their classroom, and it's more just available to their entire grade, not so much scope to a, a specific class. Uh, printers all around the school. Um, we, we obviously give them access to printers in the school, and that's all in self-service, but they do have the ability to um, add printers the normal sort of Mac way um, when they're at home. And we put major system upgrades in there. Uh, a few years ago, there was a firmware update that uh, had to be ran. Apple had advised being run on machines, I think, before uh, upgrading to Yosemite or something. So I had to get that out on all machines. And so that was something that we had to inform students about and, and the importance of it and, and why they need to run it and sort of put a little bit of scare into them also so that they would actually do it. Uh, but it was in self-service. Um, we, we, the major system upgrades, however, um, because previously uh, things like the version of Photoshop that we had was, was Photoshop 5, I believe? Yes, yes. CS5. CS5. And that required Java to be installed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> grown. <laughs> and Crash Plan actually for the longest time also in, uh, required Java. So we had two things where we had to make sure uh, Java was installed. So I couldn't just drag and drop the, um, the OS installer into uh, Casper Admin and have it do its magic in the nice way that, that uh, Jamf does it so that it can become a self-service item. I had to create a custom operating system installer. So there's a great thing out there called Create OSX Install Package. And so um, I'd use that, and I used another piece called First Boot. And these two things uh, together uh, let me pre-install things like Java. Let me pre-install things like Flash that Apple was removing when um, you would upgrade the, the system. So I would create that, push it out to all the machines. Um, and we would segment that too. We would say one grade, you know, this day, and then the next day we would start the next grade and so on and so forth. Because we're talking like a six gigabyte package at this point, at this size, and uh, pushing that out to uh, 500 plus devices will 
for sure choke up your network. <laughs> um, so it caches onto their machine. Um, I use an extension attri attribute to uh, see what the size is to make sure that it's cached correctly. Um, if it fails, it, there's a smart group that says, you know, this extension attribute uh, is not equal to this. Try again, basically. I had to create uh, a logic, a sort of a programming structure within the JSS because it's not there. And I was able to do this with like an extension attribute, smart groups, and things like that. So if it's correct, then it shows up in self-service with another smart group. Um, we, we would push out, tell the students to upgrade, and then hopefully they would uh, Upgrade. <laughs> uh, other uses that we use for Casper, we have a thing that we like to call DCN Androizing. Um, sometimes machines are leaving us. Uh, you know, uh, we give them the ability to purchase out their machine if a student is leaving early or something like that. Um, and so things that this DCN Androize script does, it, it removes it from our AD. It uh, removes our firmware password. It removes software. It was just a great, easy way I could scope a machine individually to uh, be in this group, and then you know I'd let them, once again, run that. Uh, we were able to, with uh, leveraging scripts and configuration profiles, make secure machines for testing. Uh, a script that would disable the Apple built-in Apple spell check. It would automatically open text edit. It would, you know, turn off everything and with a profile lock it to like simple finder with nothing uh, able to be open. We also use it to find missing laptops and it, in a way solving crimes because we've used the JSS. A, a machine was stolen um, from a, a parent, a, a child's house. Actually, their entire house was robbed. It was, it was uh, awful. Um, cameras, everything were stolen. It was before we were putting a firmware password, so the criminal booted up, created their own account, everything like that, but didn't reformat in the machine, and it kept checking in. And it's telling me now, you know, that he created this account under his name. So with that, I was able to, you know, search on like a Facebook and like everything. And we turned this, this information into the police. We had an IP address, everything, because of the JSS. And this was legit the only reason they were able to find the criminal, apparently. And it was a uh, like uh, uh, career criminal, as they called him. So this was the first time they actually had locked him into to being there. Um, and so a lot of these things that I, I do, I didn't create. I will fully admit I'm not the smartest person in that sense. I, I'm, I'm, I know where to find things, and these are great resources out there. The J, Jamf Nation board is, I, I can't stress how important it is to me. Um, all of these, uh, um, Rich is here presenting also. Um, so make sure you're uh, you know, checking out these sites. Make sure you're, you're on that mailing list. These are such active resources. Um, before touching Casper Suite in 2012, I had actually never even heard of it. And now I'm an expert, I feel, on it and able to do so much with it. So anyways, thank you all. Good job. Thanks. All right. A great presentation. We do have a couple questions coming in on Twitter. And again, if anyone wants to, the hashtag is on the board there, JNAC2016121. So the first question was, uh, can you share a little bit of like what was the logic behind not letting students have admin rights, uh, and what was driving that decision for you? So the uh, students, we didn't want to give them admin rights because we knew they would remove things that uh, were required. Um, and that's, that's evident because we've seen them remove uh, Dino, which is a software that we use for the, the uh, uh, teachers to be able to monitor what they're doing in class. Because um, we have had an instance or two where a student, before we put firmware passwords on, you know, booted into the recovery mode and turned, uh, turned themselves into admins, things like that. So um, immediately students will remove things that they're not supposed to. And I, I'd imagine uh, a lot of them would have even went in, forward and installed Windows on their machines because we've had that asked before. Yeah, we consider it a school-owned device up until the three years is over, and then it becomes theirs um, at no extra cost. It just, it, as far as we're concerned, it's our laptop, um, and it gives us a lot of flexibility, and the parents are happy. Um, 
That's a good question, but I mean, I'm, I, when I say our, it's our, it's collective, meaning the school, but I mean, honestly, it's IT, yeah. All right, thank you. Another question was, uh, how, oh, there we go. Uh, are you auditing software usage using the licensed software feature inside Casper Suite, now Jamf Pro? We are not, actually. Um, but this year, we may start to because of things like the licensing for Office and the licensing for uh, um, the Adobe Suite and other things like that where it's become a lot more expensive. It hasn't become just a simple uh, license. Uh, I think uh, Smartboard is another one that we, we're starting to watch and see how many teachers actually use because they think their projector is the Smartboard. So we're leveraging self-service and then like Creative Cloud, as um, Bob said, we can see when somebody downloads it and basically takes a license through the Creative Cloud licensing a um, agent. And you know, we bought 450 licenses because we figured that would cover our faculty and staff as well as our students that would actually need to use it. And we're at like 135 and that's expensive. I mean, we're paying $12,000 a year, what we used to pay $12,000 perpetually. Um, so. Things like that make sense, but we don't actually um, leverage that functionality yet. And you mentioned that you're installing CrashPlan for all of the laptops. How often do you find you're using CrashPlan to do restores? Um, not often, actually. <laughs> uh, where it's become useful, though, is uh, let's say there's liquid damage to a machine and, and it, it gets a total replacement. Um, so uh, every so often you do have a total replacement or a hard drive lost like that, and we're able to restore, you know, uh, we back up their desktop and their documents because we feel as though that's where their important things are going to be, not their music, not their pictures, not their movies because, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll just add CrashPlan and its competitor Druva, they're both very similar. They're awesome, awesome products. They're also, for education, they're kind of getting very expensive. And I think that they're looking more for legal you know, ramifications of why and how they back up. And so their costs, I don't know, are comparable with education. So when you're thinking about it compared to like a, you know, a Google Drive, you know, where it takes the user to drag stuff, it's, it's a tough sell because we may do 75 restores a year, but with the increase in costs, it's, it's, yeah, it's not something I can necessarily say jump on for yeah. schools where they're not profit earning. Previously, those, uh, you know, that saves a day for those 75 people and worth every penny of it. But as the price increases and they're forcing us to go to their cloud model and things like that. $30,000. I don't know. Yeah, we're going to have to weigh it out. <laughs> All right. One, uh, we're right before lunch. So one more question and sure. we'll have to run out on time. Um, so you mentioned that you're using the Google Apps for Education and uh, I think you mentioned you're blocking iCloud services. Are you using any iCloud services with this deployment, or is this full local and then Google? Uh, full local and Google. We don't use any of Apple's uh, services beyond, like, I guess, DEP and VPP for our uh, iPads for uh, what we use them. Um, yeah, we, you know, with Apple School Manager, it doesn't integrate with our, um, our student information system, Whipple Hill, so it... It's not going to be useful for yeah, us Yeah, it's a tough sell. Uh, like Google Apps and uh, Microsoft 365 is, is very similar, or they're catching up. They integrate really well with everything. And as everybody, I like, we love Apple, obviously. Um, we give them a lot of business. We absolutely love Apple. Apple doesn't quite integrate as well um, with their services. So Google Apps has been fantastic to us. They access all their files on their cell phone, which is an iPhone, as well as in our LMS, their SIS. They can update and um, submit documents straight from it. It's just a really easy solution. And the backup services for it are dirt cheap. Yeah, awesome. Let's give uh, James and Bob a big round of applause. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.